On the day last week's episode released, Lucinda and I got all dolled up and we went to a Kamala Harris for President rally in Savannah, Georgia. Us and like 12,000 of our closest strangers got together to wave signs, applaud county names, and cheer on our candidate. And it was, in a word, transcendent. Now, to understand why, you have to start with how much I hate literally every aspect of this thing, because they're not really clear with you in advance about the location and timing of events like this. Part of that is because campaigns have to stay fluid to a certain degree, but most of it is because the Secret Service doesn't want to tip their hands any sooner than they have to about where anybody's going to be, right? So when I signed up to attend, all they told me was to be in Savannah between the hours of 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. Savannah's two hours from my house. And it's a Thursday. That's a, that's a work day for me. I got I to gotta record GAM with Eli and Cecil the next day. So I've got to somehow get a full day work done prepping that episode while blocking out 10 hours to attend this rally. So we, we get there. The parking's a fucking nightmare. There's a, it's a newish venue, and I'm guessing they've never dealt with a crowd that big before. So we wind up parking in one of these improvised lots that are cropping up at every paved surface within a mile radius of the place. Then we go, we stand in a 13-mile-long line uh, which might not have been that bad, except there had been a torrential downpour right before we got out of our fucking car. So a good percentage of this line is just in ankle deep water. So we stand in this line in this thick, swampy South Georgia in August after a rainstorm air for about a, almost an hour. And then we basically get to airport security. And I fucking hate airport security. Yo, if they were making a cartoon about us on this show, my arch nemesis would probably be like airport security man or something, but I suffered through all of that in wet socks. And then I go in and inside the building, it's, it's a bit of a clusterfuck trying to seat everybody. But eventually Lucinda and I, we settle for a spot standing near a ledge with a good view of the side of the stage. And we stand there elbow to elbow with strangers for about four and a half hours while an indefatigable DJ keeps the crowd excited for state senators and party officials leading up to the main event a short speech from Kamala Harris that I mostly already heard uh, at the DNC. Now, I know I've just described this as though it's a terrible experience, but the point is that despite reading like just a list of all the things I hate doing most in the world, I fucking loved it. I wish I could go back to another one every day between now and the election, standing there amongst all these people I'd never met, people of all different ages and ethnicities, the whole rainbow of sexualities and gender identities, rich people, poor people, all squeezed in there together, united in a purpose that is as vital as it is revitalizing. We're all feeding off of each other's energy, trying to lift each other up with our smiles, trying to embody joy in the hopes that a passing camera will allow us to temporarily represent the exuberance of that crowd. And I'm, I'm sorry to be so verbose about it, but I really don't know a shorter way of describing it. It was a feeling that I had never experienced before. And on my way home, it occurred to me that that feeling that I was high on, and that I'm still high on a week later, was probably exactly the type of exaltation that people go to mega churches for. It has a lot of parallels, right? The music, the unity, the rhythmic movements, the shouts of support, the call and response, and hanging over all of that, of course, this grand sense of unifying purpose. This feeling that what, what you're doing matters more than anything else in the whole fucking world right now. And sure, that, that may be granted me some sliver of sympathy for people who get caught up in churches, but far more than that, it just pissed me off. Because, you know, feeling the real thing that they were co-opting just made the fact that they were co-opting it that much worse. It was like finally seeing the original and only then realizing what a piece of shit the remake really was. See, the purpose, the, the, the sense of being a small part in a grand narrative, that was the intoxicant. That's what we were all getting high on. And that makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, right? I was experiencing the feeling of making the community better with that community. I was experiencing the joy that comes with a collective effort towards a better world. And it makes sense that evolution would favor people who get high on that, right? And much like any good high, I left wanting more of it. That's the advantage, right? But that's also where churches usually step in because they can offer you that very same feeling, can't they? Sure, the narrative is some bullshit about a spiritual war against a satyr for the future of ghosts, but it's compelling as all hell. And there's a part for you to play in it so you can feel that same captivating feeling of purpose without all the trouble of actually having to have a purpose. Because, you know, having a purpose, that's a whole big fucking thing. Real purpose is subject to setbacks and failures and disappointments, but pretend purpose. 
the kind that the churches offer, well, that's bulletproof. God always wins in the end, so you never have to worry about feeling that pang of loss. And when you look at it through that lens, you know, how can you not be enraged by it? There exists inside of most of us an innate desire to make the world a better place. And churches have redirected that instinct towards their own coffers. Yeah, sure. Sometimes they actually channel it into good works from time to time. But the pool that they're dipping into is the good works pool to begin with. So that's hardly worth celebrating. The fact that you stole some of the money isn't mitigated by the fact that you didn't steal the rest. But luckily for me, I'm secular. I don't have it in me to get high on imaginary accomplishments, and I still want to taste that elation again. But I know that I can only get there by actually doing something, so I'm doing something. I'm volunteering for the campaign, and I'm helping arrange trips to the polls for local voters. I'm boosting the online signal from the campaign through my social media channels every chance I get. And perhaps most importantly, I'm tapping into the greatest resource that I have available to me, you. That's right. On Saturday, September 21st, we're going to be teaming up with Tom and Cecil over on Cognitive Dissonance like we've done before, and we're going to raise some fucking funds. Because as much as I hate the system we've got now, it is the system we've got now, and money makes the difference. So we're going to be breaking down the intro to Project 2025 in a two-hour live stream starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, again, on Saturday, September 21st. And the whole time, we're going to be encouraging everybody to chip in and donate to Act Blue. We've already got over 12 thousand dollars in matching funds available so every dollar you donate during that period is going to be doubled and by then by the time we get to the 21st we're hoping that number is going to be even bigger collectively we did not do enough in 2016 your grandkids are going to be dealing with the consequences of that and i'm sorry if your grandkids are already dealing with those consequences i meant their grandkids i remind myself of that every day whether i want to or not we didn't do enough, and we unleashed the ugliest shit American politics has seen in my lifetime. Join us on Saturday, September 21st, in trying to ensure that we don't make that same mistake again.